Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Syria's local committees warn against foreign intervention as the regime is accused of torture. Bahraini teenager killed in anti-regime protests. And Israeli settlers training attack dogs ahead of Palestinian UN bid. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. Demonstrations and raids continue in Syria as Amnesty International releases a report on deaths caused by torture. The U.S. State Department confirms that Damascus retains control over its chemical weapons, and French President Nicolas Sarkozy states that the Syrian president's actions are irreparable. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said 473 people were killed in Syria during the months of Ramadan, including 360 civilians and 113 soldiers and members of the internal security forces. The observatory indicated that 25 minors and 14 women are among the killed, adding that the death toll does not include victims killed during the military operations in the city of Hama due to the difficulty of documenting those cases. The operations were carried out from August 3rd to August 10th. Amnesty International confirmed that 88 Syrians, including 10 children, died in detention centers and police stations between April and August, and indicated it has the details of those cases. The organization indicated that at least 52 people seem to have been subjected to some form of torture, which probably contributed to their death. As for the local coordination committees, they warned Syrians against resorting to carrying weapons and calling for foreign intervention in their anti-regime uprising. The committees stressed the need to maintain the ethical and peaceful nature of the revolution and urged Syrians not to get sucked into a playground in which the regime is clearly superior. In another development, lawyer and human rights activist Ibrahim Khalil said heavily armed security forces stormed the office of lawyer Mustafa Sulaiman in Aleppo and arrested him along with his wife. This comes as night demonstrations continued yesterday in a number of areas. Rights organizations confirmed that soldiers, reinforced by tanks, raided a number of houses in the neighborhoods of Al-Qusur, Al-Hamadiyya, and Al-Zahiriyya and Hama in their search for activists. In addition, they stormed the town of Hula in Homs. Videos posted on opposition websites showed heavy gunfire targeting demonstrators in the town of Al-Hara in Dara, where four people were killed, including a child. The Syrian Revolution Coordination Union confirmed that at least five protesters were injured by snipers in the cemetery of al Kabun neighborhood in Damascus. Videos posted online by activists showed soldiers firing at demonstrators. On the political front, and after the U.S. expanded its sanctions to Syrian Foreign Minister Walid Maallim, Presidential Advisor Boutaina Shaban, and Syria's ambassador to Lebanon Ali Abdel Karim Ali, the U.S. Department of State announced that the Syrian regime maintains control of its nuclear weapons. State Department spokeswoman Victoria Nuland said, quote, We have long called on the Syrian government to give up its chemical weapons arsenal. That said, we do believe that Syria's chemical stockpile remains under government control. The spokeswoman added that Syria has a stockpile of nerve agent and some mustard gas, indicating that the U.S. is working with like-minded countries to ensure there is no proliferation of that material. In Libya, clashes broke out between Gaddafi's battalions and the National Transitional Council forces in the Umm al-Kanadil region and its surrounding areas leading to Sirt. Chair of the National Council, Mustafa Abd al-Jalil, gave Gaddafi's loyalists until this coming Saturday to surrender before the battle is dealt with militarily. The NTC fighters' movements on the ground indicate that Sirt may be the next battlefield to eliminate the remainder of Gaddafi's regime. 
مسلح المجلس الوطني يقتربون من سيرت من الشرق NTC forces are approaching Sirte from the east and the west but they are refraining from launching attacks hoping the city will surrender through negotiations المفاوضات لا تزال جارية Negotiations are still ongoing between the NTC and Sirte's tribes to enter the city without fighting NTC fighters say that they are slowly advancing towards the city to give the negotiations a chance and we will give them uh, the opportunity to do so. This window of chance or opportunity closes with the end of the official holiday for Eid al-Fitr. And beginning from next Saturday, إذا لم تكن هناك بوادر سلمية لتنفيذ هذا الأمر على الواقع، if there are no peaceful indications, clear peaceful indications for conducting this on in reality، فإننا باستطاعتنا حسم الموضوع عسكريا. ويحاول المجلس الانتقالي إعطاء المفاوضات. The Transitional Council wants to give the negotiations a chance because the battle for Sirte will most certainly be the most violent one. There are at least 50,000 loyalist Qaddafi fighters entrenched in the city with weapons and ammunition. The revolutionaries consider their entry into Sirte, the birthplace of Qaddafi, to be strategically and symbolically significant in their efforts to strengthen their control over all parts of Libya. Meanwhile, the search for the Libyan colonel continues. The NTC said it has a good idea of Qaddafi's whereabouts. القذافي الآن هارب وعلى فكرة نحن. Gaddafi is now trying to escape. By the way, we can tell you that we have a good idea of where he is. وكانت بعض الشائعات قد أشارت إلى أن القذافي. Rumors are circulating that Gaddafi is still hiding in Tripoli, or perhaps has fled to Algeria, or arrived in Europe as a refugee. باسم البيت الأبيض. However, a spokesperson for the White House said earlier this week that there is no tangible proof that Qaddafi has left Libya. Yasser al Bardisi, BBC. European Union diplomats said European Union sanctions against six Libyan ports for oil companies and more than a dozen other entities could be lifted as soon as Friday. Yesterday, the United Nations Special Envoy on Post-Conflict Planning for Libya said Libya's interim leadership has rejected the idea of deploying any kind of international military force or observers. Envoy Ian Martin told reporters they don't now expect military observers to be requested by the Libyan interim leadership. Earlier yesterday, Mustafa Abdul Jalil, chairman of the National Transitional Council, NTC, said that Libya did not need outside help to maintain security. Martin, however, said the United Nations expected that the NTC would ask it to help establish a police force. A suicide car bomber attacked warshippers in southwestern Pakistan today as they were heading home after morning prayers. Officials said the blast killed 10 people. The attack occurred in Quetta, the capital of Baluchistan province. The group immediately claimed responsibility for the bombing, but Baluchistan is believed to be home to many Taliban militants who have targeted warshippers in the past. Kuwait's police chief said the bomber was apparently targeting a mosque but could not get close enough because the road was blocked. The police chief said instead he detonated his explosive in a car park nearby. The blast wounded at least 17 people. بدأت إحدى جماعات المستوطنين اليهود في تدريب الكلاب على أعمال الحراسة ونشرها في مستوطنات. A Jewish settler group began training dogs to guard settlements in the West Bank to counter any possible backlash as Palestinians plan to head to the UN in September to declare a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The Israeli Haaretz newspaper revealed that the Israeli army is conducting training sessions for settlers in which they will be able to open fire at any anticipated Palestinian protest. 
They are members of the so-called Civilian Canine Battalion for dog training in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria as known to Israelis. This demonstration is showing the dogs in training how to guard and protect Jewish settlers as well as counter any possible security unrest in the West Bank as Palestinians seek recognition of statehood at the UN. People have become more aware of the threats facing them in their homes across Israel and the West Bank. The events in September are making more people worried about their security. Gosovsky is an Israeli-American activist who is well known among members of the extremist nationalist right group. He was a follower of Mir Kahana, the founder of the racist anti-Arab Kah movement. After Kahana was killed by an Egyptian in New York City nearly 20 years ago, Kosovsky launched the Kahana movement alive. Today he is following in the footsteps of his predecessor in defending settlers in the West Bank by training and supplying guard dogs for free. These dogs are trained to attack on command and to counter any threat. If anyone carrying a knife, a hand grenade or a pistol tries to infiltrate any Jewish town, these dogs are able to pursue and prevent them. Now that the settlers have an army of dogs, will this be enough? Haaretz newspaper uncovered that the occupation's army is conducting training sessions for settlers, in which they will be able to open fire at any possible Palestinian protests against the settlements. Is this enough? The past six decades show that bullets have failed to kill the Palestinian dream, and now dogs will not shatter that dream. senior U.S. lawmaker has introduced legislation calling for United States funds to be cut off for any U.N. organization that supports giving the Palestinian Authority an upgraded status at the world body. Republican Congresswoman Ileana Rose Lettinen of Florida said the bill would also withhold a portion of U.S. dues if the U.N. does not change its funding system. The U.S. State Department criticized the legislation, saying it would do more harm than good. We have. We oppose this legislation. Cutting by half U.S. funding to the U.N. would seriously under, undermine our international standing and dangerously weaken the U.N. as an instrument to advance U.S. <coughs> national security goals. The security establishment has begun to instruct the Jewish population of Judea and Samaria on how to react to possible terror attacks as it makes preparations for mass Palestinian disturbances that may emerge following UN consideration of Palestinian statehood next month. IBA's Dennis Zent has more. The possibility of violent demonstrations following the Palestinian bid for statehood is causing an upsurge of anxiety amongst members of the Jewish communities in the West Bank. According to security establishment assessments, the expected disturbances could be similar to the mass protest marches that took place on the borders with Lebanon and Syria on the Palestinian Nakba and Nakhsa commemoration days. The IDF is reportedly conducting an escalated training regime for civilian security chiefs in the settlements and supplying them with non-lethal weapons. When questioned about her reaction to this news, State Department spokesperson Victoria Nuland sidestepped the issue. Apart from saying that we have regularly engaged with both Israelis and Palestinian governments to urge them to do everything possible to maintain peace and security in the West Bank, uh, and we will continue to do that, we um, the right path for both sides is to come back to the negotiating table. Haifa University professor Dan Shuftan was more direct. You can't say to an Israeli settler, because the leftists don't like you, we will not help you when people come to kill you. I mean, you, what do you want? So that people will come to, is that Palestinian terrorists will come to Itamar, but then in Itamar they will not be helped by the army to defend themselves, and before the army arrives, they will not do anything but against it. doesn't this create small private uh, settler no, it militias? It doesn't. It doesn't. Bahrain regime forces 
have killed a teenager during anti-regime protests in the southern city of Sitra. 14-year-old Ali Jawad was shot dead after Bahraini forces attacked protesters following aid of its prayers. He was shot directly into the face by a tear case canister. His death has sparked angry protests in the northern village of Dair. Reports say regime forces stormed the village and were trying to run over the youth. Human rights activists have repeatedly warned over the increase in the number of deaths due to excessive use of force by Saudi-backed forces to crush the uprising. Also, families of detained protesters say the authorities have canceled their appointments to meet their loved ones in jails without giving any explanation. Let's talk about this with Mohamed Al Maskati, who's the head of the Bahrain Youth Society for Human Rights, who joins us from the capital, Manama, on the phone. Mohamed Al Maskati, thanks for joining us. The protests are going on nonstop since they began several months ago, despite the brutal crackdown by the Bahraini regime, security forces, and those of the uh, obviously Saudi Arabia. You had the king come out saying that he's going to pardon some of the protesters, and now you have this. What do you think is the reason for this unrelentless protest movement? Actually, the protester for a long time is not, not stopped uh, for a long time. And it is continue uh, from 14 February until now. Uh, what the King's speech is saying that all, all the violations happened in Bahrain is, is a personal act. And this is wrong, because what happened today is, 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 is not a personal act. The security forces attack the protests and uh, the guy uh, who were uh, protesting got shot directly in his face and fall down with uh, bleeding and he died so it is it's not a personal act it is it, uh, it is something from the upper uh, authorities who, who are giving orders to attack the protesters okay we have that but still uh, looking at what the regime has tried to do, use force and political gestures to appease the protesters. Meanwhile, we had this leak uh, from a high government official by the name of, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with, I would think, Dr. Salah al-Bandar, strategic planning's chancellor of the Council for Minister Affairs, in which he was uh, actually, because of the information being leaked, he was actually uh, deported to the United Kingdom, in which he said that uh, the royal family, the government there, aims to manipulate the upcoming election and aims to maintain this uh, distrust and uh, the sectarian division that's there. How is that going to prove uh, uh, resultful if there were to be upcoming elections and at the same time trying to gain the trust of, let's say, the opposition al-Wafa? See, about, about what's said by the Salah al-Banda, that there is a systematic attack on the Shia sector. And about the elections, no one now in Bahrain is speaking about the election because most of the of the political society boycott this election because they don't want to be participate in violations of uh, of human human rights. So all that propaganda used by the government and authority to tell the people outside the country that they are doing a democracy. But they 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 choose to to repression the uh, the situation in Bahrain, attack the government, to attack the protesters, and that's that's the, the result of what happened today. The Taliban have attacked the largest American military base in Afghanistan. A NATO statement says a missile hit the Bagram base north of the capital Kabul early on Wednesday. There are conflicting reports about the casualties. Our correspondent in Kabul, Faiz Khorshid tells us more about this attack. Most of the U.S.-led air strikes and other military operations are being operated and coordinated from the same base. The rockets have been fired by the Taliban militants, and the Taliban has issued a statement claiming responsibility for these rocket attacks, and they said that they killed over 20 American soldiers. It's not something new. This base has been attacked many times by the Taliban militants. But it has been also attacked by other militant groups like the uh, Haqqani Network and also by the uh, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar Network. 
network in it uh, in that area where the base is located is very volatile but this is not only Bagram other US military bases in other parts of Afghanistan like the second largest US military base in eastern Afghanistan in Jalalabad city also the third US military base in Kandahar all these bases have been attacked many many times by the Taliban militants During the joyous Eid al-Fitr holiday, Somali refugees facing hunger and disease continue to suffer. For its part, the Iranian Red Crescent Society and other organizations provided medical aid and necessary supplies to the refugee camps in order to ease the suffering of the hundreds of families who hang their hopes on the aid. Not many displaced children here in Mogadishu's refugee camps are smiling on the blessed holiday of Eid al-Fitr. Indigent orphans in this tiny hut began their Eid holiday waiting for their poor mother who went door to door asking for a morsel of food to help their hunger, a hunger that doesn't know the meaning of the Eid. Despite the efforts of charity institutions to hold small celebrations for some of the orphans in the refugee camps and put a smile on their faces, the jubilance of Eid is absent from this camp, which is witnessing such cruel human suffering that nobody in the camp can even think about celebrating the Eid. Islamic organizations are trying to alleviate the sufferings of the destitute families and provide them with the necessary food supplies to survive this difficult time. The government and people of the Islamic Republic of Iran donated large amounts of food through campaigns in solidarity with the Somali people. The supplies arrived at the international airport of the capital, Mogadishu. A team from the Iranian Red Crescent Society undertook the mission of delivering the supplies to the disaster-stricken people in imminent need. We have delivered the humanitarian aid to the Somali people that has been provided by the Iranian people, including food and medicine, and 200 tents to shelter the refugees. The Iranian Red Crescent Society is expanding its work at the refugee camps in the capital. Thousands of families are relying on it in various parts of Mogadishu. The refugees will benefit from these nutritious food supplies. Hundreds of impoverished families here in these refugee camps are hanging their hopes on Iranian aid, which has begun flowing into Somalia by air and sea to improve the conditions of the starving people in this refugee camp supervised by the Iranian Red Crescent Society. Ahmad Silal, Al Alam, Mogadishu. Iranian artists are renowned for painting Quran verses on woven textiles. They managed to produce the world's first woven Quran, on which artist Yusuf Madafi depicted the Quran's verses. Ahmed Ali has the details. The charm of the Holy Book of Quran is not limited to its eloquence and articulation or to its sentences and verses. Its charm is also reflected in the aesthetic value of its characters and words, which has drawn wide attention from artists of various schools and backgrounds. Weaving the verses of the Quran is an art that Muslim artists care a great deal for. They use their creativity to produce an edition of the Quran with one of the finest materials materials used to make thread, silk. Silk is characterized by its exquisite tissues, delicate texture and beautiful appearance. The aesthetic value of the verses of the Holy Book of Quran motivated us to move forward in our artistic work and produce weaves of Quran verses. What we did was design the graphics and combine them, then use them to produce the textile. We managed to produce a large amount of these weaves in different sizes with various designs. The Iranian artists continued to advance on their path of weaving the verses of the Quran until they succeeded this year in producing the world's first silk Quran. This woven silk Quran was created by Iranian artist Yusuf Madadi, a native of Tabriz city in northwestern Iran. 
This edition of the Holy Book of Quran contains 130 pages and weighs 8.5 kilograms. It took about six months to weave five parts of this edition, and finishing all 30 parts of the Quran may take about two and a half years. The calligraphy used in this edition of the Quran was inspired by the late Hajj Agha Nairizi and was woven in 30 different colors and various types of gilding. The size of the page is 50 by 70 centimeters. We tried to introduce this edition of the Holy Book of Quran to the world and we received invitations to show it in a number of countries such as Qatar and Lebanon. As for the characteristics that distinguish this edition from other types of Quran, we can say for certain that the woven Quran will be more durable and less susceptible to damage. It is worth noting that an important feature of this valuable work is that every five pages of an ordinary edition of the Quran are woven onto one page. In addition, each page is leather rimmed, making it washable. The production of this unique edition of the woven Quran in Tehran coincided with the holy month of Ramadan, the month of the revelation of the Holy Quran. Ahmed Ali, al Farat, Tehran. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.